Hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. Where are they? I don't see them. Do you see them, Brennan? I don't see them. There they, they are. They exist only in our hearts, Griffin. They're, they're, they're here with us in spirit. Oh, good. It feels, it feels that way sometimes. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the, to the live stream. The only one that I'm doing this Max Fun Drive because I have a, a, a child who doesn't sleep anymore. I'm, I'm running on, Brennan's been, we've been talking for like a half hour now. You know the rowdy energy, this rowdy sleepover energy that I've got as I explain the uh, rule set that I came up with for the next season of, or I guess the current season of Adventure Zone, Ethersea, uh, which was in the works like six months ago or so. So yeah, man, those wheels are turning. It's the, the energy's fresh. And uh, thank you, Brennan, for joining me on this, on this, uh, this voyage. So, so truly excited. I see a sheet full of numbers, I'm talking about rules, homebrew. Oh, baby, I couldn't be more psyched. Thank you so much for having me. So Brennan uh, was, was actually the first game master for the first uh, game system that uh, came out of the, the McElroy family, which was Dadlands. Uh, and I feel like you left a, an indelible impression uh, on, on that on that rule set uh, during your live uh, session uh, with it that you ran me and the fam through. Uh, that was truly one of the most fun days of my life, uh, going to Comic-Con and doing the Dadlands show with you guys. Cause the system was really like svelte and lean and it was very obvious what the kind of point behind it, like it was very clear when you look at a game system like that and you're like, here's, how this is trying to help you tell this kind of story. And you guys also had design help from, correct me wrong, was Keith Baker your help doing that or no? Who was the- who was Yeah, the we, ta we tapped Keith Baker, who uh, uh, was one of the designers on the uh, Bureau of Balance uh, uh, board game, uh, card game, table game, you know what I mean. Um, yes. So yeah, yeah, that for a goof, uh, for for a goof game, yeah, a lot of, a lot of cooks in the kitchen on that one. Um, I should have said at the top, I just assumed everybody knew you. Brennan does uh, Dimension 20, uh, a whole suite of, of shows over there like Fantasy High and uh, Tiny Heist was, uh, I know, your most beloved installment in the Dimension 20 canon. Uh, I, with with all of my heart, I love Tiny Heist. For people that want to see times that I and Griffin have been on the same show together, in in Adventure Zone land, it's Dad Lands, which was this awesome one-off. And over in my little... Faye Court, uh, one of our anthology, because we uh, Dimension 20 is an anthology actual play show uh, created by uh, College Humor. It's over on a uh, platform called Dropout. And there's a whole thing called Tiny Heist, which uh, we had all of the McElroys in, which was a, just a phenomenal delight, uh, which was uh, little bitty people like borrowers and insects and magic toys going on so a thrilling fun. heist. Uh, uh, the most fun. What uh, a dang hoot. I know, I know your bona fides, but before we get into sort of these these rules, which you have also taken a, a look at, I sent them to you like a month and a half ago or so, mm -hmm. um, uh, because we talked a bit about homebrew rules on uh, your uh, your your DM talk show, uh, which I cannot remember the name of, uh, for which I apologize. Uh, no worries, adventuring. We have two. We have adventuring we academy. Adventuring Academy is the, is the theory one. And then we have Adventuring yes. Party, which is the episode talk back. Uh, right. There's a lot of ancillary shows. It's a lot of shows within shows. It's a little matryoshka of content. Right. Um, I, so before we get into taking a look at the rules uh, and sort of m me talking through my thought process and, and putting it together, what is what is your, you have a long and storied history with role-playing games. What's your like homebrew kind of experience? Because I have to imagine you've done quite a bit of it at this point. Hell yeah. So um, my my bona fides, my, my curriculum vitae when it comes to tabletop, I've been playing D&D since I was 10 years old. Right. Um, you know, and a recurring pattern in my life, both with doing comedy like at UCB or, or college humor, or now being in the actual play world was always doing the thing for very many years and being like, wow, that's so cool. I could never do that professionally, <laughs> but that's awesome that people are out there doing that. So I've been playing since I was 10. You know, I, when I was a teenager, I ran one campaign to 20th level, ran another one during college way, way up there. And now I have a 12 year long, home game in 3.5 D&D that is still ongoing even while I'm oh, wild. 
even while I play D and D for a for a job now professionally. It, that's the wildest thing about this, Brennan, is that you have a have a a D and D game that you do that is not part of the many many uh, role playing <laughs> game things that you do professionally now. You know, um, yeah, you can't if if you're if you're a musician, you can't only be playing at the concerts. You still got to practice. Yeah. You still yeah. got to keep sharp, baby. Um, no, and also just there well, is. I, I, just I, I, I only compose music for Adventure Zone, actually. So that you can have that that you can realize that dream when your artistic pursuits only make you money. Only make you money. <laughs> Uh, a million percent. Well, no, I think that that is very like, and also, you know what, if I'm being honest, I just have some weird hunger in me where I do a full day of D&D &D work and get home and I'm like, you know what would really satisfy is a little more D&D. &D. Um, so, but uh, I've also played a lot of other TTRPGs uh, other than D&D, &D. a lot of like the big published ones that are, it wouldn't be quite accurate to call them indie where it's things like Cthulhu or World of Darkness, but also have a lot of friends in the uh, true indie games world. So like, uh, I've played a lot of Wickedness and have been looking to play Wander Home a couple times. And so like, have run the gamut of a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, but the 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 main thing, of course, is in all of the things I've ever done, I have always been a homebrew, uh, uh, a home brewer, right? Um, right? Much like much like you and Fandelver, even but for me, just in like home games, I tried to run one module when I was like twelve years old. Uh, mm -hmm. The players blasted off the rails in the first fifteen minutes, and I was like as they do. And I literally just made this commitment at that point in time where I was like, it's, it's almost this thing of like, uh, preparation is armor. Right. And, and like improvisation and homebrew is like agility. And I was like, I will never be a good armor fighter. Like it's not right. in my DNA. I don't know how to get the shield up in time. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spec fully out into just pure agility training and go full, full improvisation homebrew <laughs> forever. Yeah. Cause I'll never be, it's like, I got so blasted that as, as a child by this experience that I was like, never again. Uh, and so that's my homebrew. Uh, does that, I mean, does that all, does that uh, also apply to like rules, like homebrew rules and homebrew, um, you know, uh, we, economy and and other sort of crunchier facets of because that's what we're going to get into today. Is some pretty crunchy stuff. Hell uh, yes, which, yeah, um, absolutely. And I think to look, uh, I my my design work is very eclectic and weird. Myself and some of my closest friends, um, uh, Connor Gillespie, my brother Griffin Johnston, Jack Covell, who's one of the lead um, artists at Heart Machine. Um, uh, is uh, uh, we redesigned our LARP camp's magic system and like spent months like really getting into like, here's how the design principles work. So I love design and homebrew and all that great stuff. Um, but I would say my cat is screaming in the other room. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was, your cat sounds like my baby kind of, which is, I don't know what that, who that's bad for. Our, we have a little one-year-old nephew who lives in the building who's, it, whenever he sees our cat, does a, an impression of him that is so generous, he goes like, meow. And it's like, not even close, because this cat goes, no. all right, all right. Yeah. Uh, um, all right let's, let's, let's get into it. Uh, let's but, it. One last thing before we do, this is the last day of the Max Fun Drive. We are rounding 20,000. We're getting very close uh, to 20,000, which would be rad if we could hit that uh, mm -hmm. by the end of the day. So if you have not uh, done so yet, if you enjoy Adventure Zone or My Brother, My Brother and Me or uh, any shows on the Max Fun Network and you are not currently a member, I would uh, encourage you. And by encourage, I mean ask politely please go to maximumfund.org slash join uh there's amazing stuff that you can get at the different levels uh of of memberships that you can do at five dollars a month you get all this bonus content including speaking of homebrew uh a a one shot that justin's six-year-old daughter uh wrote that we played through brandon i'm gonna send it to you after this but it's the wildest it is the wildest it's the best thing we'll ever do which is like <laughs> It was also a one-shot bonus content thing, but to hear it, you got to become a member. And there's, but there's a ton of stuff on there for you to listen to. And uh, 
yeah, it would mean the world. Your support is how we've been able to grow and continue doing this show. Adventure Zone spun off long after Mabim Bam had been going, uh, you know, part of the Max Fun Network. So it is it is because of the support we've gotten over the years that we've been able to do more and more stuff. So maximumfund.org slash join. Uh, think about it. Help us out. Mm, thank you. And uh, let's let's get into it. Amanda, do you want to turn on? I'm not exactly sure what this is going to look like. Uh, turn on the the spreadsheet. Okay, you have done it. Okay, so this is uh, a lot, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through it. Uh, you have the spreadsheet open, I'm guessing. Uh, you know right? oh, it. I just saw your little face pop in. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is sort of a uh worksheet that I've been kind of collecting thoughts in. Um, and then organizing them in. I didn't know how to use Google Sheets, I guess is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, it is, uh, I learned how to color code in order to make this uh, spreadsheet, which is very, very exciting. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, gussy this up at all and make it look prettier, um, but but this is, this is what I've got so far. I want to start with this sort of like broad goal of what I was hoping to do with this, with this, like with these add-on rules, um, to to boil it down, uh, I wanted the ship. Uh, this is going to be a season about sort of exploring the ocean, the undersea uh, in in ships and ships. There's going to be a lot of ships and a lot of characters with different ships. And for the party, I wanted the ship that they were on to one be like an important setting that they are invested in and that they can. Uh, grow and tailor and and really make their mark, sort of making it their own thing. Um, but mechanically speaking, I am thinking about their ship as being a shared character, like a a a shared character sheet that in ship combat sequences uh, or ship exploration sequences or whatever, uh, they all work off of this same sheet. Uh, there it is. There's the money. There's the money right there. Is the will the cat continue yelling at you unless you are actively holding it? Um, he is a real cuddle bug, and um, I get scream if, if I, I will get screamed at walking past him, and he'll be like, "Stop walking and sit down somewhere yeah. so that I can get on top of you." Because <laughs> let me tell you, buddy, you're warmer than the couch, and I don't know yeah. why you haven't fucking gotten. I've, that I've always said that about you, Brennan. <laughs> Um, so mm -hmm. there is a, there's a lot of numbers on the screen right now. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll, I will go through them and sort of explain what's going on. But really, I think that if you think of this as kind of like a D and D five E character sheet, like a lot of this stuff is going to, uh, kind of be obvious like ac is ac right mm -hmm. uh hull is hit points uh when that hits zero uh your ship goes critical and is going to explode um speed is how quick the ship can move uh sensor is how good it is at aiming at things um so in making it a shared character sheet i am peeling away or attempting to peel away specializations or um uh roles or uh, you know, I don't want one of the players this season to only be the gunner or only be the mechanic or only be the, I didn't want to pigeonhole anybody. Um, and so this system is fairly like player stats agnostic. Uh, there will be one player who will be the pilot and I will get into sort of how the piloting system works as I'm envisioning it. Um, but everything, like if you're on this ship, you can do anything is what I kind of wanted this to be because I didn't want any one player to feel like, well, I could do this like zany thing I thought of with one of the tools on the ship, but you know, I'm the, I am the mechanic, so I should probably go and repair that thing because that doesn't sound especially fun to me. Maybe mm -hmm. it, it would be fun for, you know, if you're playing this not for a podcast or video or whatever. And if you had more people in your, you know, uh, party that you were playing with and you wanted to go that like very Star Trek route, like rad, like maybe there's a version of this that works, but that's sort of, sort of how I'm envisioning this. When they're on the ship, they share this sheet and they can use whatever they, they need to on this sheet to, to get by. Um, mm -hmm. yes, please. If you have thoughts, please just interrupt me and, and hop right in. Well, I was just going to say, I think this is great design. One of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, that everyone listening to this should know 
the the standards for homebrew design are different than for professional design. Mm -hmm. and, what I'm, and what I mean by that is not like, hey, it's just for your home game, forget about it. What I mean is you can design around knowing who your players are and you can design around knowing who your characters are. Like a professional designer has to look at a piece of work and go, okay, is this going to be overpowered when played across 20,000, 50,000, right. 100,000 games. Whereas for you, you can look at something and go, okay, is this magical item overpowered? Yeah. Maybe, but, but it's going to the underpowered character. Right. So so in other words, your your standards, because you're making something that you know exactly what you're making it for, the terrain kind of changes and the math you're doing in your head to try to keep things balanced. Right. Even up to the point of wondering if balance is even important, right? Like, sure. Uh, uh, and I would say um, with like, for example, I would say to someone looking at like, trying to create a submarine system like this, uh, you're you're going into this saying like, I want it to be character agnostic because you know your brothers and your dad, you know right. exactly who this system is for. Yeah, yeah. There's and there's there is a lot of this like it looks very crunchy right now because I'm mm -hmm. showing you a spreadsheet full of numbers, but a lot of it is uh, especially uh, position, which is sort of the big breakthrough that I had with this system that I will probably probably will be the first thing that I explain because it, it's everything else kind of hinges around that uh, mm. is is dealt with an abstraction. Um, so I didn't want like your ship has a speed of 60 feet. Uh, and so it has to be within 150 feet in order to do that because that's like we have never paid attention to that. We've never paid attention to speed or distance, which is like a pretty big part of D and D. Yeah. I admit, but it's just not. It's just not how we do it, really. Theater of the mind is pretty yes. raw when it comes to like area of effect, distance, and range. Right. So yeah, having speed be a bonus makes total sense. And again, I love that, yeah, everything about the the idea of this is a character, which also solves another problem that you had going into this one, which is that this is a modality within a larger game of D&D. &D. Yes. Meaning, meaning that like your PCs can still leave the ship yeah. and have a whole suite of just D&D &D abilities, of like character yes. abilities. So like whatever system you make shouldn't represent the sum total of what your encounters in this world are going to be like. Yeah, um, and I, I also want to mention a lot of the math on here is is very subject to change, uh, especially costs of things. Like uh, I wanted to ask you about economy because it is the one thing I think I'm struggling with the most, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm gonna start sort of getting into it a little bit. So I mentioned position. The big thing that I kind of figured out is uh, it, abstracting out the relative position of ships in a dogfight um, because there's the version of it that is very tactical and very um, realistic. Uh, and then there's a version of it that is a lot more in the sort of, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of different games. Uh, Uncharted Worlds, I believe, is a space opera. I, if I'm destroying the name on that, please let me know, chat. I apologize. It's been a very long time uh, since, since I read it, but it, it abstracts out certain things uh, into simple roles for broad like ideas for broad broad uh, concepts and it doesn't get like too super crunchy with it. Yeah. So uh, position is like a status. If your ship is in position, it can do a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of weapons that are very powerful that can only be used in position. There's a lot of tools that can only be used in positions. There's a lot of uh, what are called gambits that the pilot can do that can only be done when the ship's in position. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of each round of combat, the two pilots roll for position. One ship will be in position, one ship won't. I don't know how this means if there's more than one ship. That's another thing that I have to solve for. Um, but that's like literally all of the motion of combat in the ships, um, which I had to simplify just because it's the way that we play D and D is usually very not paying attention to the rules a whole lot, but also because I, it would be way too hard, I think, to describe that stuff super specifically on a 
on a podcast and have people kind of follow along. So instead of saying, okay, your ship moves there and their ship moves there and their ship moves there, whoever wins the position role basically describes the scene and where the two ships are. And then everybody takes their turn sort of after that. Yeah. That is, that is how position works. Um, mm -hmm. And that is what the speed modifier is for. Uh, you, you roll a D20 and you add your ship's speed. So a bigger, heavier, uh, more armored ship will have a lower speed stat and will be, have a harder time getting in position. Um, but that is the trade-off that they make for, you know, their, their, their large S. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uncharted Worlds is the game. Yes, it's powered by the apocalypse. Thank you, uh, Frank, in the chat. I appreciate that. I thought that was what it was called. Um, so I, what other stats on here are sort of not uh, immediately apparent? Um, readiness, I'm going to get into a, a little bit later on because it's another thing that I think is only interesting in the context of us doing this for the Adventure Zone. Like that mechanic explicitly exists because of uh, the the... I'll just talk about it now. It's wild for me to put that off. So um, during, I, I, I'm breaking this this campaign down, or at least hoping this campaign will break down a lot less into um, these huge 10 episode, super like dense and uh, n like always trying to be very narrative forward arcs and much more like two or three episodes like, Here's a here's a board of jobs that you all as contractors can take on. Pick which one you want to do. Go out and do it. Um, mm -hmm. And with that in mind, every time that they go out on a mission, instead of having systems for uh, navigation and uh, you know research and go, you know finding all these details for how to complete the mission and going out and you know do you have enough supplies for the trip? Do you have enough gas for the trip? Are you going to run out? All of that is abstracted out into readiness. So if you have like really nice crew quarters on your ship, if that's how you've invested, you have a readiness bonus there. If you stock up on a lot of supplies beforehand, you'll get a boost to readiness. If you do pound the pavement and, and get some details, some data, some intel uh, about the mission that you're on, you'll get a boost to readiness. If you don't do that stuff, like if you go out with bad intel, I'll, I you know it's, it is a, a negative to that. And then that modifier is applied to, after you leave the city on your mission, uh, a D100 roll, uh, which is uh, based on the wild magic table, essentially, from, from the uh, wild magic sorcerer that, that uh, I, I played during, uh, the, during graduation. Only instead of like, uh, some, you know, your ship grows three inches or something like that, it's events. So it's uh, with a really high readiness roll, you find, you know, a sunken ship that you can salvage all these parts off of, that you can salvage, you know, a lot of great stuff. Uh, middle of the road one might be more sort of, you know, grab bag. Like maybe you run into like a, a strange trader who has, you know, stock that you can't get in the city. Or maybe, uh, you know, uh, an animal has gotten on your ship somehow before you left and now you have to deal with that and a bad one is some monstrosity from the deep is going is now attacking like the bad ones will be very bad because i want this readiness system to have like a, a serious heft to it um so yeah that's that is how i'm thinking about uh uh navigation and prep and all of these things and obviously like there will be a narrative element to that as well, right? Like I still want those scenes where you go into the tavern or whatever and find old old shady Joe who knows the knows the ins and outs of uh, you know how things work around here. Like I still want that stuff. Um, but this is a mechanical way of adding what I think will be a pretty wild, like I am essentially like just pulling my, the rug out from under my own feet sometimes because I imagine I will have a plan for a mission that could be completely sidetrack or waylaid by a very bad readiness role. And now you have to deal with this, you know, uh, mutant octopus thing. Uh, right. Well, like every mechanic ideally plays into like, as someone who loves crunch and loves mechanics, you want every single mechanic that you put into something to conform to 
genre, right? Yeah. Like why does classic D and D not have like wound systems or like think, think about just a system where the less HP you have, the worse you start fighting. Yeah. Now there's, now there's a reason D and D doesn't do that because D and D is high fantasy and you're meant to pretty quickly while you're leveling up, become these sort of like glossy high fantasy heroes. Right. So, and, and mechanically we know that um, what hat, like just for example, that thing of like, okay, an injury system, the more HP you lose, your character starts getting minuses. What happens? You get death spirals. As a if a character starts to lose, they start losing even faster. What happens? This world is going to really prioritize assassins and characters yeah. that hit you hard first and fast because there's even more benefit to that kind of strategy. Yeah. So what you're always looking at is, to me, I think you like. I love crunch because crunch is a tool for establishing genre. Right. This, this readiness tool you have, which is a function of this wild surge, but it's a surge for like the ether sea itself for like the ocean itself. Yeah. What that does is it establishes a genre where like, Hey, events happen here in this location that um, are wild and strange. Like it is always inadvisable to even go out there. Yeah. <laughs> like, like in other words, like, you know, when you add a dice shoot to every single expedition, what you are saying is going out into the ocean's a crapshoot. And that yeah. becomes an element of your genre. Like, I know you want to go to the lost city of so-and-so. You're probably going to find a sea serpent on the way. And the sea serpent's not going to have anything to do with Atlantis. There's just some damn serpents out there. Right. And really keep your head on a swivel. It's a bad idea to go out there. I really, I really do want. I know we've said this before, and and haven't been necessarily great stewards of it, but I, I really do want to get get crunchier this season and get a lot more like, um, less less way less structured. And this system, I feel like, is is a a guarantee. Like it it will force us to kind of do that because I could completely foresee like missions that f fail. Like mission, they don't. Say, we have never not succeeded well with some some exceptions uh on, on in our campaigns and mm -hmm. i would i think it would be exciting to have that you know be an option i know i'm saying something that seems like so completely obvious but like um i i i feel like this system is one like we had so much fun with the wild magic table in in graduation like it was a complete blast it's the reason i picked the class that i picked for for fitzroy um but but too like this idea of random encounters, which is what they'll probably be called. Um, I I don't know. I feel like it 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 will I it will be exciting for me to not always kind of know what's what's coming around the bend. Um, yeah, I I think I think randomness in this context like is a part of nautical storytelling. Like when you look at like classic adventure novels at sea, they are kind of picaresque. There is this element of like stories like Alice in Wonderland or something where it's like, I don't know what Tweedledum and Tweedledee had to do with the Jabberwock, but the ocean's big and there's weird stuff out here and right. you're gonna find it, right? Um, but also to any, to any fans that are watching this and seeing all these numbers and all this great crunch and going like, you know, like I know being like, I know the adventure zone is like theater of the mind and very story forward. This seems pretty crunchy. What I would say to like calm their nerves is it's not, you can't always just go hand wave. We'll just do it with storytelling. Like, yeah. you know, you, and the reason is this, part of the genre of nautical storytelling is the sailors and the mariners having a deep knowledge of their vessel being yes. like being like i know how hard it is to repair this thing i know what it means when we take 30 damage versus 5 damage yeah. i know what it and like in other words it actually, in some ways, like you're looking for a sweet spot because it's like, yeah, I don't want to deal with range and distance. I'd rather just simplify it into position. But also, if we don't have hull points or we don't have readiness, or we don't have other stuff, we're not going to nail the genre. The tone yeah. won't be right. 
Yeah, my dream. We have not started recording uh, EtherC. We've recorded. Uh, I don't know if we've put this number out there, and I don't think we're keeping it secret. There's five episodes of Setup where we're playing uh, the the Quiet Year uh, oh, yeah. by Avery Alder, which is so kick ass, and I'm so excited for where that went. We've recorded those. We recorded those months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have not started playing this this season, so uh, and probably won't for another few weeks or so. Uh, and so that gives me time to kind of tune this up. My dream, the 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 Ideal scenario for me is their first mission. They want to spend their money on a cool, you know, uh, uh, flechette launcher or uh, a cool, like, um, a, a cool bomb or something, or like these, this very, like, um, right brained, like, DD. I wanted the thing that can do the most damage. And they don't buy, like, food and they don't, like, <laughs> Uh, you know, invest in crew quarters and they don't like go out and grease some palms to get intel. And so their readiness rating is like garbage. And so they go out and get like eaten by a sea serpent or something like that's That's the dream to God. sort of instill that instantly instill that like, uh oh, you have other things now that you need to just take seriously. We have sunburst and scatterburst. Well, you needed to treat your hull with <laughs> yeah. hydroxyparatide because now you got sea slugs and the yeah. ship is just covered in slugs. Just so many slugs. Uh, okay, so uh, other stats up here. Uh, hull is the health. Like I said, AC is AC. Readiness I've talked about. Speed I've talked about. Sensor is just the flat roll that you uh, add when you're attacking. That's it. That's mm-hmm. that's that's all there is to it. If you have better, it, it'll also be used for things like um, contesting stealth checks or other things where like your ship needs to find something. Mm-hmm. Uh, a a sensor role will also be used for that. But this is one of those things where like I didn't want one player to necessarily be the one who uses the weapons because I didn't want other players to feel like they shouldn't do that. And I don't want that one player to feel like they can only do that. Yeah. So if you attack with a weapon, everybody uses the same modifier essentially that. In, in, improves as you get better and better, uh, you know, sensor parts on your ship. Yeah. Um, uh, engine is so everything that's not sort of like a weapon or a room on the ship is is classified as a tool. Um, and this can be things like, uh, you know, dive suits or, uh, um, you know, uh, anything up to like, it, in, like a cloaking device or a. Uh, uh, a salvage arm or a grappling claw or anything like that. Like those are tools and there is a limit to how many of those you can have on the ship based on your engine power, because that's what those run off of. Um, which I kind of put in there just because like, I want the tools to be wild and fun. And I want there to be ones that are like not broken, but uh, able to be used in some real fun lateral thinking ways. But I also didn't want the ship to be, completely you know bogged down by those uh so there's sort of a a a cap on on how many of those you can you can have um you mentioned uh wounds early on and the uh systems on the ship which sort of provide the different stat modifiers for it uh it kind of have a system like that because i still i didn't want it to be abstracted out so completely that a ship is like a person where you get hit a whole bunch of times and the person still works fine, but a a ship like, you know, I wanted there to be some reflection of, you know, if you hit a ship in the right place, if you take out a ship's, you know, rudder or propeller or whatever, like it ain't going to go as good. If you hit a ship in the sensors, it's not going to shoot as good. So there is a, uh, a damage system here, which you can see check marks, baby. That's professional right there. This is professional grade spreadsheet. I was overly modest about this when we started. This is a good ass Griffin, this is a thing of beauty. You've made something, it's gorgeous. My eye always is drawn to whatever section, the layout, it's like the main stats up there. Mm-hmm. Here's the systems, cargo and facilities over to the right. Where everything it couldn't be more clear. And again, I just want to keep bringing it back that anything that starts to seem like crunch, you just run it through your head and go, do you want to run a submarine game yeah. where where a character never gets to go, we've lost our engine or we've right. lost our sensors? I wouldn't. If someone was like, no, nah, we're just doing HP for the submarine. And when it gets to zero, the whole thing collapses. I would be like, this, you've offended me. And I'm <laughs> actually angry in real life because I want to see an engine go out and then have an alarm go off and say, yeah, someone get to the engine room. You know, that's, yeah. if we're not doing that, what the hell are we doing? 
Uh, a lot of people in the chat are mentioning FTL, which was absolutely the system was uh, inspired by. I don't know if you ever played FTL. It's an incredible roguelike game where you're on a ship exploring the galaxy and acquiring upgrades and different crew members and leveling up. Uh, but when you battle, you can target different systems on the ship, like take out their life support uh, to try to kill everybody on board the ship or take out their weapons or take out their, you know, whatever. This is, this is inspired by that. Cool. To, to damage a ship, uh, there's two ways to do it. One is you use a weapon that is designed specifically to do that, um, which a lot of times those are going to be more difficult weapons to use. And I'll get into uh, the the modifiers that are in there. But like positional is one of those modifiers, right? So, you know, maybe there's a weapon that is, uh, if it, you know, hits, it can actually, you know, punch a hole in the hull. But you have to be in position to do that, which means your pilot has to win the position role or else you can't do that thing. Um, and a lot of those sort of modifiers play play into each other. So I'll, I'll get into those more later. But as for the damage, uh, I have sort of a description over here and a quick sidebar. I have a whole rule thing here, but it's... Um, maybe I'll, I'll kick it on here for a little bit. Uh, where is damage? Uh, here it is. Okay. So, uh, if your hull, there's two levels of damage, as you can see here, uh, right. Uh, mm -hmm. one is minor damage. One is major damage. Minor damage is, it will affect your ability to, you know, continue <laughs> using the ship. Well, uh, hull, I wanted that feeling of like, you know, pressure, pressure breach. Like this will, will I mean, if you damage your hull deep, deep enough under the ocean, that's it. Like you will be dead. I've I read a lot of books about undersea exploration uh, in prepping for this season, and uh, there have been some times where things have gone not so great uh, for people who got holes in their ships. Yeah. Um, so it won't be quite that dramatic, but you take damage if your hull gets uh, uh, busted up, and if it gets super busted up, you take a lot of damage. So you mm -hmm. do not want uh, specifically two d twenty two uh, d ten. So you don't want your ship to get to that that point obviously um another factor is uh there's a repair roll that you have to do when your your ship is damaged and you roll it regularly just a d20 roll uh when it has minor damage but if your ship ever gets to major damage you have disadvantage on the roll so if a part gets major damage like you're you're boned like you're in a lot of trouble and need to like really prioritize fixing that um sensors i mentioned before uh it it affects your ability to target ships so if your sensors are damaged you have disadvantage on attack rolls if they're very damaged you can't attack until you fix them so if you can take out a ship's sensors like you know the death star like this some big dreadnought uh, if you can manage to heavily damage their sensors, you can take out their whole sort of weapon array. So I wanted there to be a bit of sort of strategy around there. And once again, that's rewarding players paying attention and doing good storytelling. You describe some horrifying battle station that's covered with guns head to toe, and it becomes very clear like, hey, this thing is a battle station. It doesn't need to be in position. It's got guns on every yeah. goddamn side of it. And a... a a savvy pilot goes, okay, am I going to roll to attack the weapons of which this thing has a trillion? Right. Or am I going to get a little bit clever and do some good storytelling? And I'm going to go, okay, where's this thing's sensor? Where's its life support system? Is there, right. any, is there something I can do environmentally? Is there something I can do? Which is just, again, because... This is one of the hard things about role-playing games, which is, yes, you want to abstract things into rules, but also, like any game since the dawn of time, like chess or anything, you want opportunities for the player to figure something out and feel smart. And that's right. an important element of it as well. I love it. Um, uh, the propulsion system is basically the same thing, but for speed, uh, if you're propulsion system is damaged your speed modifier becomes zero so your pilot could maybe still win a position roll right like it's not out of the question they could roll a nat 20 or something like that and still manage but if the ship is uh if, if the ship has taken major damage basically the pilot can't do anything <laughs> and mm -hmm. so that will need to be remedied before like the pilot can't for instance run away yeah. which like there's a whole i have a whole rule set for escaping which i imagine will be probably have to happen at some point. I think blowing up an enemy ship this season will be like rare. Like I think that, cause you don't see that a lot in, in your Star Treks or your whatever, where they actually like, you know, 
blow up the other ship. There, a lot of the times, the the enemy or they will have to sort of turn tail and run until they can, uh, you know, come back a bit stronger. Um, and with the engine, yeah, if the engine takes damage, then there's no power and you can't use ship tools. And if it takes major damage, the engine room basically combusts, and anybody who is in there uh, <laughs> will probably be uh, uh, very, very grievously injured. I shall perish. Oh no. Um, um and then for repairing those things, uh, you can repair minor or major damage. Like all of it goes away if you if you complete the repair check. The repair check is again character agnostic, and there's no uh, modifier that goes into repairs. I'm waffling a bit on this part of the system a little bit because, like you know, I I, I can't really suspend that so far that like if somebody is. Um, if somebody is like experienced in shipwrights tools or something like that, if somebody has expertise in those things, like, you know, maybe you get your proficiency bonus added onto it or something like that. But otherwise it's a flat D20 roll. The trick is that uh, better parts, higher quality parts are easier to repair, a much lower repair check, right? So like, your average run of the mill, you know, propeller, your average run of the mill propulsion system isn't going to give you a huge speed bonus, but maybe you just have to roll a five to mm -hmm. repair it and that's it. Or you can go with, you know, Dr. Krankenstein's like experimental propulsion system, which can go much faster, but you is it requires a, you know, a oh, D10. We, we a, a gotta, D10. Yeah, we got to send out for these parts. These parts won't be here for another six weeks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And 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 what I like about that is that you don't get into it, it. It slows down the power creep a little bit. Of you know, we've got the plus four speed propulsion system now. Let's go buy the plus five one. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's like instead of just thinking about that, it is remember. Remember the last mission we went on when our sensors blew up and they were bad sensors. So they were, you know, it took us a few rounds to repair them and that was bad. Uh, maybe you invest more in parts that are a little bit easier to, to, to repair. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about that. Uh, it, as, as for how you damage the ship, right. I think I mentioned this like earlier and then completely fell off. Uh, you have weapons that can do them specifically or on a critical hit you you can damage a ship part. What I'm not sure about, and I'd love your input on this, is whether or not to make that, you know, uh, somebody attacks the enemy ship and crits, in lieu of double damage, they damage a ship part. The question for me is, do they pick which sort of part is damaged, right? Because you can narratively say like, uh, okay, you got a critical hit. Where are you? Where were you aiming? Oh, I was aiming at the propulsion system. Okay, the propulsion system now has minor damage. Does that give the player too much sort of retroactive power? Because the alternative is you roll a d4, and you know whichever side it comes up on corresponds to one of the four different systems on the ship. So check this. Okay, that's awesome. Check this out. If you these attack rolls. That yeah. a ship is making probably are only happening once per round, right? Like we're assuming that a ship probably does not have multiple weapon systems to make multiple attacks per round. No, it it will. Uh, every it, the ship won't act. The players act, right? Gotcha. So the players will uh, either utilize a weapon or a tool or you know whatever on their turn. That's why you do actually kind of want more than one sort of weapons hard point on your on your ship uh, for 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 that for that reason. Cool. To, to me, m one of my like central tenets just for like games in general is like best role, best outcome. So to me, I feel like on a nat 20, you deal double damage and pick the ship part that you okay. damage. That's how I would go with that. But that's again, bearing in mind that like um, these different ship parts have hit point totals, right? Right. So if no, 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 the ship, the ship parts don't have hit point totals. The ship okay. itself has a hull total. And then the hit points for the systems are the two sort of bars of, of, and, of damage. that. They and have. there's two levels of damage, which is minor and major. Right. Exactly. Cool. So I would say there's, so there's an interest. There are a couple interesting things that work here, right? Number one, you want to reward nat twenties. Number right. two, I would probably say, 
if you're attacking a ship, I agree that like it, putting a whole system for called shots, right? That's it, is much. all. It's always rough, right? So I think the idea of like if you deal a hit, we roll randomly to see like what part of the ship you damaged, maybe. Um, and maybe there's some math on your end as well, where like, well, it depends. Do you see every single attack on a ship as affecting one of these four systems? No, 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 not cool. at all. I, I think it, it is, there aren't that many weapons that can specifically, uh, you know, at attack them. And I'm pretty sure all of the ones that I have sort of in my list of potential weapons uh, has like a, a uh, recharge period so you can't like use it every you can't back to back rounds like i hit their sensors and then i hit them again and that's you know yeah yeah pose. so i would say i would say f for my money right um on a normal hit there are no called shots you deal damage you might consider doing something fun with regular hits of dealing a certain percentage of the ship's remaining hull begins to take out a system. Okay, yeah. So that way what happens is let's say, let's say like a single attack does like if if a single attack does 25% of a ship's remaining hull or something right. like that some easy fraction, right? A quarter or half or whatever. It's like that's going to be minor damage. If a single attack does 50%, we're going to roll D4s twice and you're going to get major damage to one system and minor to another. Yeah. And in other words, what's going on is that like um it's it's a function of how much of a ship's hull you can do in a single turn. Right. That way if some mammoth battleship comes along and you're in some ranky dink thing it's like first shot that connects it's like oh we're immediately screwed <laughs> right yeah this is so so bad um you know for that encounter where you want them to like surrender and like have the other have the bad guys board the ship because it's like hey you got hit one time and right. your, your whole thing but on the other hand there might be something i don't know how crunchy you want to get it because there's also something funny about like if a ship keeps taking damage but as the shots are coming in none of them are doing these colossal blows right. so you could get to this certain kind of battle where like no individual hit ever actually did 25 percent of our ship's hull uh, and so we're like slinking out of here with like 12 out of 80 hull points remaining. Right. But we're looking like engines are fine, weapons are fine, sensors are fine. Whoo, yeah. boys, what? <laughs> <laughs> Which is also kind of a fun genre moment to right. have where your ship is in tatters, but you're like, we made it. How about right. it? Right. Um, what do you what do you make of the repairs? The the idea of repairs because I, I I'm I'm genuinely very torn of whether or not I I, I like the idea of it not having a a modifier and so then the number that you're concerned about is the quality of the part rather than yeah. the skill of the person but like i feel like that i don't know i'm worried a little bit that that uh gets rid of something that could be potentially interesting about like you know uh, proficiency let's zoom out of this for a sec and first of all, i just wanted to say to, to to wrap up the earlier point as well i was just going to say that like the um with with damage and hull and systems and all that stuff like that the reason i would i would maybe say let people call a system out at, on a nat 20 is just that like you know you have you're gonna have you have three pcs how many attack rolls are possibly happening in a given round knowing that a nat 20 is only a five percent yeah just just two right like ideally because one person's going to be piloting the ship and the other two are going to be you know manning manning the systems or whatever so every round there's a 10 percent chance if, if right. the other two people are only attacking there's a 10 percent yeah. chance of a nat 20. most combats are like four ish rounds give or take a round so it's like you know most combats probably a nat 20 is not getting rolled yeah. even in a combat where all the other two players are doing is rolling nat 20s so making those nat 20s count i think is always like yeah blast their sensors hit yeah. them in the engine like okay. great you're right. Um, yeah, that's that that mathematically that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if it if if this was for a different group of people who were playing with a larger team, like maybe it wouldn't make with, a lot of yeah. Uh, with a lot of, with six players doing multiple attacks around, right. that math changes very dramatically, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, and remember also, you 
make because it's three versus one you you as a gm are going to hit nat 20s on them oh, yeah. more than you would proportionally against a party of six pcs so like that nat 20 rule is gonna hurt them as much as it helps them you know what i right. mean like um but um, to your other point about about the verisimilitude right right of like i think this is something that i think people that play in this system after listening to Ether C. And I think for you guys as well, is something that I would consider a variant system here. Maybe three or four, like as you said, you guys haven't started playing this yet. No. Three or four episodes in, maybe Travis and Justin and your dad all start going like, well, wait a minute. I I kind of see myself as an ace pilot and the other right. two characters go like, yeah, that's not really for me. I kind of want to be Scotty in the engine room or I right. kind of want to be the dude in, in the, in the gun pit or whatever. So I think that what you're talking about is like, there is always this struggle in design between verisimilitude, making things realistic and the genre that, and story you're trying to tell. Right. If, if you and none of your players are interested in the role that expertise plays on a ship, then to hell yeah. with it. You yeah. know, like it's like then then it's fine. And and you know, verisimilitude, it's a magic submarine game. Right. You know, like yeah. oh so but what I would say is it all has to do again with, with, you know, we're not trying to I'm always more interested in measuring joy than truth. Absolutely. And, and there, if there is more joy in people being equally proficient at repair, piloting, and weaponry, yeehaw, let's yeah. go. But I think that's something to, to be cognizant of is uh, people do, there's a reason people like to talk about their Hogwarts house. There's a reason people yeah. like to file themselves into roles. Yeah, that's fair. And p pigeonholing is something that after a couple episodes, you may well find that someone's like, I like the grizzled old mechanic vibe. Right. And the cool thing about this system is slotting in player expertise with the system you have here will be effortless. Like yeah. just going like, yeah, it, like an ace pilot is going to make these these speed rolls differently than someone else. Maybe it's a plus one to the ship. Maybe it's a it's, plus two. It's, I mean, it's it doesn't even have to be that. It's proficiency. Like 5e yeah. has this system in it already for anything. Like if you play the, the if you play the pan flute, and you're proficient in pan flute, mm -hmm. you get a bonus to your role with the pan flute. So like they, you know, you can do that with more or less any concept. Um, and in, yeah. the, in the number systems you have here, the nice thing is that the arc of these systems on most of these roles, yeah. um, uh, the arc of these systems on most of these roles uh, would take proficiency really well. So that idea of like speed is plus four, sensors plus four, adding a plus two is really significant. Yeah, but it's not the it's not the end of the story, right? Sure. It's like it's it's very much a dance between the ship's abilities and the pilot's abilities. But you also, if you start to add proficiency, get those beautiful moments where a twentieth level pilot who has expert who's like a rogue. Han Solo, hello, who like has double proficiency in piloting. Yeah. Let me know if I get too excited about this. I'm having the time of my no, life. No, I am as well. This is, a, <laughs> this is a delight. But like, you know, if you have a 20 level character with a plus six proficiency bonus, who is then expertise in piloting and throws a plus 12, you get the beautiful moment of the ace pilot with plus 12 in a rinky dink rust bucket piece of crap right. with the imperial cruiser behind them with some imperial academy greenhorn who's like i can't get this guy in right. my system i can't get him in the crosshairs and it's just like yeah this is an ace pilot it doesn't matter that he's piloting a fishing boat you will never catch this guy so you know there's th but that system is so easy to slot in right after a few episodes of testing out a player agnostic system. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Uh, another thing about repairs that I also should have mentioned is I imagine that like repair kits will be something that you can, you know, stock up on. If you want to spend your money on, I, I love that in, you know, video games and role playing games and whatever in like you, you, you love that money because it lets you get the cool sword that, you know, g glows or whatever. Mm -hmm. But do you save up for that so much that you don't invest in 
repair kits and you don't invest in supplies. Um, and I imagine like with a repair kit, you can just spend your turn to repair a system. No questions asked. The, the kit is used up and, and you know, that's powerful, but also like you spent money on that. And I, I, I want there to be an economy in this game that they feel like they should take on the tougher, more dangerous mission because it's going to give them, you know, X amount more, more gold. I want to make them greedy, I guess is what yeah. I'm saying. Um, one thing that I also should mention, uh, which has nothing to do with greed is the max fun drive. Uh, <laughs> we are asking you, this is the last day of the drive. Help us get to 20,000 new and upgrading members. Go to MaximumFun.org slash join. Check out all the different uh, levels that you can join at. $5 a month. Uh, you get hundreds of hours of bonus content. I, Taz has been going since 2014. So I, there's probably like seven bonus episodes of Taz on there of like various wild types. But uh, I mean, there's bonus episodes for all the shows. And when you give it $5 a month, you get access to all of them throughout history. Um, Ten dollars a month, you get a uh, an enamel pin designed of the uh, around the show of your choice by Megan Lynn Cott, as well as the bonus stuff uh, and the uh, membership card. Uh, there's there's a ton of stuff that I'm uh, I don't have in front of me because I'm I'm having I have a lot of stuff in front of me already. Um, but please, if you enjoy our show uh, and and you enjoy the stuff that Max Fun does, uh, go to maximumfun.org slash join and uh, help us help us hit help us hit twenty thousand. We're at eighteen. Four six five, uh, according to the counter on the stream right now. So we're getting close, but only you can make it happen. Make it happen. Where there's how many? There's two thousand people in the in the stream right now. I know. We got this. Everyone, everyone, call a friend right now, real quick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, okay. What haven't we? I mean, there's still quite a bit we haven't talked about. Uh, but a lot of this is pretty straightforward like cargo mm -hmm. you have cargo space do we want and we can also jump around too sure we, we've talked a lot about economy which we should probably talk about yeah i i have nothing for economy. basically i i i'm curious and and this is like the biggest roadblock for me this is the biggest like project for this system that i have to figure out yeah is how to work out and an economy for these systems i will jump around quickly you can see i have these tabs at the bottom uh, these are just like some ideas for weapons. And these are a few ideas for tools and a few ideas for, you know, part upgrades and a few ideas for facilities, right? You want rooms on the ship that give you sort of, you know, bonuses and different sort of narrative opportunities. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to math it out necessarily so that you know, uh, you can afford the affordable parts and pie in the sky dream of getting the, you know, more expensive parts someday when you become a much wealthier, you know, uh, adventurer. So full disclosure, I have played so many different tabletop games and in many of them, I e avoid economy in totality mm. because in my experience, even in things like 3.5 D&D that require you to have a certain GP value of magic items for like certain levels, I would just literally award people magic items. But I would, do, but for me, I was like, it's a very rare genre where money conforms to the story we're telling. Like the idea yeah. of like, that we're there on the field, there's King Arthur, there's Mordred, and King Arthur draws Excalibur and says, Excalibur! the sword I bought at the sword store. It's like, <laughs> yeah. this is a bad vibe, right? The vibe, sure. the vibe rancid, right? So, however, that doesn't mean I don't like economy. I played in a maritime pirate campaign that my brother ran and my character was obsessed with wealth because piracy doesn't make any sense as a vibe if you're not talking about money, right? right? Um, so it always still comes back to come back comes back to vibe. Another great one is like uh, Patrick Rothfuss uh, with with the whole you know uh, the name of the wind. Like uh, I like Kvothe as a protagonist is one of my favorite protagonists because he's a broke wizard. So right, he learning, needs he needs, needs that money. Needs that money. Right. Um, and I was like, so talking about fantasy currency matters a lot. The character's broke. Right. And when you're broke, you're thinking a lot about money. So 
I think I, I want to I want to clarify one thing real quick that I am exclusively thinking about currency at this point, at least as the capacity to which they are able to customize the ships and modify the ship and improve the ship. I'm not thinking about it in terms of like you buy the sword, you buy the, the, you know, crossbow that you want. I'm thinking about exclusively as a investment in the ship, because that for me is kind of what this whole system is, is, is more or less about. Um, so that's, 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 that is sort of the philosophy I think behind the economy that I would like to design. Hell yeah. And I think that makes a ton of sense, right? And also, by the way, these guys are contractors. Right. If their primary motivation is monetary, but you never stress the importance of money in the mechanics of the game, then it's sort of like, I do these jobs for cash that effectively vaporizes the moment I get it and it has no right. kind of material, you know, like... Um, so what I would say is bird's eye view, how do you want currency and economy to feel in the game world? Because one of the things that happens in classical D&D, in other games that have, there are games that have fully logistical economy, meaning you have money and you spend it. There's like Final Fantasy, right? Like classic, like, Every corner store has a way of bringing someone back from the dead. Don't think about it that right. hard, right? Um, and you, and what I tend to find happens is there are three to five sessions, or like one adventure, one sort of like a quest piece in Final Fantasy where money's interesting. And then very quickly you have 70 million gil or you have 150,000 gold pieces. Right. And it it's like it's like you start broke, there's a there's a few little levels where money's interesting and then very quickly you are you are like Jeff Bezos with a buster sword and it never right. matters again. And it just like it just rockets into the sun. Jeff Bezos definitely has a buster sword by the way if you think he does isn't i hope oh god it's a depressing thought okay but the important thing right is that we we want to think about how money feels right so in my experience when money is logistical in order to make it matter you really need upkeep cost you need you need stuff mm. like you need stuff like hey I'm taking away a certain amount of money every day you're alive for food, clothing, upkeep, all this stuff. Right. W was your was your character, does your character have a family? Did your character have an ex-wife and a child that has a school? Right. You, had, you had public, like like private school bills to pay? I don't know how EtherC works, but like. Well, I mean, that is, I, I feel like that's readiness. Like, I feel like you have to, the upkeep is like, you know, when you go out on a mission, you have that, that you know uh mm -hmm. call of duty pre-match like you spend your points on uh you know whatever things you want to take in like how mm -hmm. much of that do you save for the upgrade that you want for the cloaking device but like you shouldn't not buy you know supplies because that'll you know lead to a pretty bogus like readiness rating that will that will hit you that way yeah. um yeah i haven't thought about the sort of upkeep costs for the the ship beyond that uh, cause for me, I, I, again, sort of, in, I, I think it works better for us abstracted out, like in, in, in the readiness score thing. So that's very cool. So I, I think also that abstractedness is preferable to like a, a strict amount of cash, right? Also because that allows for more interesting displays of wealth rather than just like, I have a sack of coins with all my wealth in it. It's sort of like, okay, like we 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 have some cash on hand, but we also have some like equity in our like ships trading right. company, but also some a lot of our wealth is just tied up in the gear on the ship. And also, you know, we, we're waiting, we have a contract, so we know we have money coming in and da, 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 da. And it's like, boil all that down to a readiness score, right? right. And that becomes great. What I think you might want to consider is that like a readiness score deteriorates over time. That it oh, can't yeah. 
for sure that it just I, like i think i think uh there will be very expensive upgrades like upgrading your crew quarters i think will cost quite a bit of money way more money than just some supplies for the trip i think once a mission is over all of the supplies that you bought are got like it doesn't just deteriorate like it's it's gone so it's much cheaper to like boost your readiness rating a little bit for this mission but if you want like a permanent one that doesn't necessarily degrade it 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 will cost you more money sort of up up front um making a permanent shelter is a better investment in the long run than just a temporary shelter yeah but there's exactly. a tremendous cost of getting a permanent shelter same thing with intel because that makes sense like the intel from the last mission is not going to help you in the next mission uh and mm -hmm. if you go into a mission with no intel or bad intel again that's going to hit the hurt hurt your readiness score as well but maybe you have like a navigational system that you spend a bunch of money on that adds a permanent bonus to readiness because you have it on the ship and it's always helping you um that's i really dig that i um what was I going to say? Uh, are you familiar with the resource die system? Do you know about resource die at all? No, I don't think so. So an awesome uh, consultant that we had for Unsleeping City Chapter 2 was this amazing designer, Joe DeSimone, who actually helped us adapt the resource die system into a system we used to reflect um, uh, sobriety for two characters that were dealing with uh, uh, recovery and addiction in that season to kind of create a thoughtful and uh, responsible system of reflecting that in the right. characters. Um, and the way that the die system basically worked is he, uh, uh, this guy, Joe Simone, who again was an incredible designer, adapted it from a system that was actually used for, like you're saying, like, oh, we like the vibe of, it was, f it's from like a system that had expeditions. And it's like, we like the vibe of things costing something. We like the vibe of whatever this thing is here. We like this sort of vibe in general of like, um, needing to know if we were prepared or not. Right. Um, but so what it sort of was, and I think what they used it for was inventory, where like you have a resource die and you, you roll it. And as long as you don't get a one, um, you have the thing you ask for, right? So it's sort of like, hey, do we have rope? And it's like, you have a D6 resource die, roll it. We got a four. Yeah, you can have rope, that's great. When you hit the one, you don't have the thing and your resource die degrades. Goes down, okay. And now it's a D4. Now, I don't know if that system would be perfect for like very big and expensive things like shield right. systems and stuff like that. But that's just one interesting way to think about like a system that represents finite resources without being kind of like a narc about it, without being like, you have to buy it, you have to have thought about it ahead of time, you have to do all this work, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Uncharted Worlds, uh, this is this, the, the game I mentioned earlier, This that is how they handled uh, economy, is they had a modifier, and it's a Powered by the Apocalypse system, so it's, you know, very small numbers, which, uh, no matter which way this goes, like, I definitely want to preserve that, like I want a ship upgrade to cost five, you know, whatever, instead of five, 500 or whatever. Because I feel like when the numbers get too big, like the, it, the meaning is lost a little bit more. Um, but they, uh, Uncharted Worlds abstracts it out even more where it's a stat. And if you want to get something, you roll with that stat bonus. And you can increase that stat by like having good cargo that you've found, like treasure that you've found or whatever. Um, and, and that's a fascinating way of doing it. It just, I feel like a lot of the things, a lot of the goals I have for this season, like choosing your choosing a mission from a board, like I want that to be a thing that they can do. And I feel like currency is, is fuel for that. Um, and it's never, that's never really been true for Adventure Zone. Like we've never really given a shit about currency. And I'm kind of curious to see like, if, if we can make that a, meaningful and not like super obtuse like thing in 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 this in the system because i also think it goes towards tone like i think like you mentioned the 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 pirate vibe like you the money has to kind of mean something if if you're going to incorporate it and and so that's that's i don't know that's how i've been thinking about it but that's the resource die thing i had not ever heard of and it sounds I, like yeah it's very cool I totally hear what you're saying. And there is also something cool about like 
when you abstract that currency stuff, it's obviously very cool for like getting to the point. It's like, yeah, I want to have the threat of resource exhaustion. I want our characters to be like, we're running low on resources. Right. But I don't want to think about it too hard. On the flip side, maybe there's something fun, of, again, for your dad and your brothers of like the idea of like, no, I can say out loud how much money we have. Right. I can say like, we are 300 shells short of what we need for that upgrade. Right. Where are we going to get 300 shells in two days? Like, and then you can have threat some, you know, mermaid crime lord. I don't know your world, Griffin. I am assuming a mermaid crime lord. Sorry. Hey, he's like, hey, you're going to be swimming with some different fishes. Um, the point is, <laughs> what would uh, that be? The, the alter? I'm going to put you on land to walk with. You're going to be walking with the marmots, buddy. Um. <laughs> Uh, Dimension 20 on dropout.tv. Yeah, um, it, yeah. <laughs> catch it. Catch it. Catch the plug. Um, but, you know, like, I think that, like, there's, there is something to be said for, like, hard and fast currency amounts. Yeah. And then, and then you get the fun thing, too, to, because, because depending on your world building, cool, you find a pile of gems. You find an ancient sunken treasure. Now you can maybe have fun scenes where you're like, cool, the guy's not going to sell us the new upgrade to the engine for a statue. We need to go have a scene with this fence. Do right. we want to go to the dangerous fence or do we want to go try to sell it ourselves to this wealthy benefactor who right. might not, who might give us a different price for it or blah, 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 blah. like, like with there, there are ways in which currency systems can spin into other storytelling. Right. Um, um, so I think currency is very cool. Um, what you might want to th think about in that case, um, the nice thing about D and D, and is is the whole like idea of leveling up, right? And the whole idea of we can kind of track player power in some really quantifiable ways. There is a certain level where the average barbarian will survive getting thrown out of an airplane, right? Right. And it's not that high. No, it like, isn't. It's like six or seven. You know, like it's like pretty, pretty soon it's going to be doable. Right. Right. Um, so when you when you begin to look at it that way, I think what you might want to do is maybe this is just a suggestion is create some price tiers. Right. And think about here are some upgrades that I think are really cool um, and that I am comfortable with my PCs having in the first couple of contracts, first to third level, with the understanding that by third level, everyone will have chosen a subclass for their character, some big decisions are getting made, and you go, nothing here is game breaking. Nothing here is going to make my encounter with a bunch of little Kuatoa or Sahuagin or whatever. N none of that is going to break the game balance for these early encounters. And you put those in a level and you say, all of these cost an amount of money that's kind of in line with what like the PHB puts for like, like what does a wagon cost right. in, in, in PHB terms, right? The wagon costs something that probably a beginning level PC can't afford, or if they can't afford it, they can't afford it and armor and a sword, right? right. So, uh, you know, and then you think like, okay, like if, if this is what, or like looking at what a ship is in in D and D sort of classically, and I think also you can get around a lot of fun stuff with like, um, okay, maybe maybe even the most basic ship is beyond your ability to afford. I don't know if you know capitalism exists in in the uh, in the sunken world. What a sad thought if it still does. But if it does, um, you have that moment of like. Okay, if you want to buy a ship and be the captain of a ship, you're going to have to lease it from us. You're making payments on this thing. You're like right. leasing to own or whatever. Uh, and if your first mission goes bad, you're still in the pocket. You're of still this. paying. You're still paying off the ship you exploded in the tutorial mission, right? So like you look at that, but so, so there's reason to be like, Hey, let's not buy this souped up ship. Let's buy this rinky dink little three oh, person, yeah. you know, like we let's buy the thing we can afford without having to go into the pocket of this scary trading company. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think if you do it in tiers where you go like, 
look, these are the systems that are available to you that are in the couple hundred gold piece range. If a ship is like 250 gold, it's almost like a couple of PCs and NPCs could actually pool their, even just their starting wealth and buy that if they didn't, if they made sacrifices elsewhere on their character sheet, right? right. Um, but I think what you want to go is like, okay, now we're getting into fourth, fifth, sixth level. This is where we're going to have the real dog fights. This is where some real stuff's going to come in. And I think what you do is maybe think about having exponential price increase where you're like, there is no humble fisherman on the planet who can get this sunburst weapon. Right. It is an exponential price increase. There are treasure troves that are out there that you could find that would overnight make it possible to launch your ship into this kind of like fighter. Yeah, piece. for sure. Um, and then that creates the genre moment you want, which is the, the heist moment of like, if this job goes off, we're never going to have to, you know what I mean? Like, right. You get yeah. That, you get that kind of moment. You just gave me tiny heist flashback in a, in a, in a major way. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we're, we're going to wrap things up in like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, probably not the last time I'll say it maximumfund.org slash join. Uh, where are we at? 18, five 51, get in there, get in there. Uh, we need your help. Maximumfund.org slash join. Thanks. Um, uh, I think gambits is the other like big thing that we haven't talked about yet. Oh, weapon tags, uh, positional. I've explained, right. Your, your ship has to be in position, which it's easier for it to do if it is a faster ship. Um, uh, and then other ones are sort of like, you know, placing limits on more powerful weapons. So charge means that you have to spend an action uh, charging that weapon up before you can fire it next turn. Um, that, I think, is uh, goes hand in hand really well with like the piloting system and the position system um, because when you do that, you are making a big called shot that your pilot is going to perform the next gambit well is going to uh, win the next position check because there could be a weapon that has charge and position. So you charge it up, but you lose the next position roll and you've just wasted an action charging it because now you can't fire. You're not in position, um, which can lead to the pilot having to take on riskier gambits maybe to, you know, try and win back a position roll that they lost. Uh, that's what charges reload is just like a, a, not a manual thing. Like you don't have to spend an action reloading a weapon. It just means you can't fire a weapon twice in a row. Uh, and precision is uh, a, a weapon that is, uh, you have an, a disadvantage whenever you fire on a smaller ship. There are five ship sizes, like tiny personal ships, shuttle, standard size ships, uh, you know, larger cargo, you know, cruisers, and then your, your dreadnoughts and what have you. Um, ship size also applies to the ram action, which is one of the pilot gambits. So let's get into gambits because it's oh, probably yeah. the last thing we'll have time to get into. And I think it's probably the last thing that I haven't explained. Um, first thing that happens in a round of combat is the position roll. And this mm -hmm. is plus speed, maybe plus, uh, proficiency bonus, uh, depending on which way this system goes. Uh, the winning ship is in position, mm -hmm. the losing ship there's not like a debuff, you're just not in position, which means that you can't use weapons that or tools that require you to be in position and your pilot can't do a gambit that explicitly needs you to be in position to do it. Um, so after the, the position rolls, the winning pilot takes their gambit first. Uh, gambits are basically the actions that pilots take on their turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of them as support for the rest of the party, or at the very least, like um, setting the strategy for for the round. So mm -hmm. if you have somebody on your ship who's just charged up this you know powerful weapon that has to be in position and you're in position and you want to make sure that it hits, you know, maybe you ready fire. And that's something you can only do when you're in position and you get your ship lined up just right with the other ship uh, so that that attacker has advantage on the roll. And that is the benefit you have granted them with your powerful gambit that was only available to you because you won the position roll. Yeah. Uh, there are defensive ones, like uh, you can gain plus two AC. So like if you're about to get, if you see an enemy ship charging up, maybe you want to take a defensive gambit. Uh, maintain position is like a gambit to assure your next position roll. So you keep the other ship kind of out of position 
by maintaining your position, which means like you don't get any other benefits, but you can keep the other ship from from getting in position and using their big nasty weapon. And maybe that's like the best thing you can do right now. All of the gambits are are most of them at least are designed to support your team, uh, like enable some sort of action during the round. Or if you use a gambit that doesn't require you to be in position, is attempting to scrape back into the fight, right? Mm -hmm. I think the standard gambit you would do if you lose the position role is regain ground. And that mm -hmm. just, I, I have add proficiency to the next position role, which may be a system that uh, will be in there anyway. So maybe it's a flat bonus to the next pro, uh, mm -hmm. uh, position role. Yeah. Uh, and that's just you saying, like, I lost this position role. If we want to get back in this fight, you know, I'm pushing it a little bit. Or you can do one of these other things like line up to try and get in position, basically doing like a wild, you know, hairpin turn. Uh, but it's dangerous because if you lose that, you automatically lose the next position role, like no questions asked. So it's 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 adding a risk reward system to the piloting system that takes into account everything that's kind of happening in the battle. If you have somebody who is about to fire off a big nasty thing or has some, you know, wild hair plan for some tool that they want to use that requires you to be in position and you lose that position role, do you risk it for the biscuit knowing that like you could push your ship too far and uh, if you fail on a push it roll, which attempts to reverse the results of a position roll, uh, you your shit blows up. Like, yeah. do you is that something that you're willing to risk to you know avoid this enemy shot that is about to blow you up anyway? But um, again, what I love about that is it's so clever because that seems ill advised unless you know for a fact you're about to get annihilated. Right. Where you where you're like I'm in a tiny little vessel. I have this huge cruiser bearing down on me. Right. This is a total roll of the dice, but I know what happens if I stay still, you know, like, <laughs> right. happens, you know, like it's very cool to, again, it's like, that's what you're always, that's a, a brilliant mechanic. It's doing exactly what mechanics should be doing of being like, this creates the, it, this creates mechanical incentive to perfectly recreate a genre moment that we all know and love. Right. So you get to be the pilot and go, wait a minute, actually, it does make sense to push it. I should push it right now. I need Perfect. to push it. I need um, to push it. Another thing I really like about this position, I, I, again, the position system was like the thing I figured out that like everything else kind of fell into place behind it is escaping, mm -hmm. which again is something that I do not think is outside the realm of possibilities. Like your ship is going to have a, you, you reference like a certain value, right? Your ship mm -hmm. is going to have a certain like class, a certain like capability based on how much you've been able to invest in it. If you go up against a stronger ship, a bigger ship crewed by more people that's going to fire at you more time, like running away might be the only thing that you can do. And the way that that works is the, uh, the, the your pilot has to take the escape gambit in one round and then next time your ship's in position, you have the right to run away. Yeah. So if you see the opponent's ship start pivoting and you see their gambit take the escape position, you basically have a, you know, a round to stop them. You have a round to, you know, maybe you take out their propulsion system so they don't get a bonus to their speed roll on the next position roll to keep them from getting in position and therefore running away. Mm -hmm. On the inverse, like if your propulsion system's blown up, you're not going to be able to escape, or at the very least, it's going to be very unlikely. Yeah. Um, so I wanted that to be a sort of like, uh, um, I wanted there to be different sort of states of of danger. Um, on a related thing, I don't think I mentioned this and it doesn't really slot into anything else, so I'll just say it real quick. When your hit, ship hits zero hull, uh, it explodes at the end of the next round and there's nothing you can do, like it goes into critical status. So you have, you know, a round and change to, get in the escape pods or fire off one last one last heroic shot or to ram your ship into the enemy ship like you have that round because that is all about that like cinematic moment of like what are you gonna do because your thing's gonna blow up i don't know if being inside an exploding ship is instant death but i think it's probably gonna be i don't yeah. know yeah that feels right that feels um, right and then this, this is the last thing because uh, time's almost out. The last action is ramming, uh, which takes into account ship size. Uh, and basically they have to 
make a saving throw, the pilot, you know, their action is ramming the other ship. The other ship makes a, a speed saving throw. And if they lose, they take a certain amount of damage and your ship also takes takes damage. I need to tune this a little bit because I'm worried it's a little too strong because otherwise the pilot could just take this action every every round. Maybe it's that the two ships take the same amount of damage. And so like, Ah, but then why would you ever ram it? This is some this is one of the like maneuvers that I've had trouble kind of nailing down of how to make it the how to make it yeah. On a failure, the definition takes damage equal to X. Yeah, I think that, that well, that's very, very interesting. Um Maybe on a failure, the defending ship takes damage equals XD12. I think, I think most ships will be standard size. Like, I think that the size thing won't necessarily be a huge factor because you wouldn't want to, you know, slam your tiny little fighter jet into a big, big dreadnought. Like, that's not going to do yeah. much of anything. Historically, you don't want to ram your ship into another ship. Right. There's not, I, I think if there was some, if there were some pilots like this is the rammer, she's taken down 20 <laughs> other ships. Right. I don't know how she was built. It's completely bonkers. Like I think, yeah. So I think the ram of like a ship taking a certain amount of damage makes sense because then it's, uh, yeah. Is there a way to do it without it being, um, you might you might consider this, like maybe a simple system would be like, hey, ramming, you have a chance to avoid it to make a speed saving throw. But if it happens, both ships take uh, a take the exact same crazy amount of damage unless a ship is like two categories bigger or two categories tougher. You could also make instead of instead of messing with size, you could make it a function of hull. So you're like, if a ship has four times the amount of hull, the, the hull score of another right. ship, it's not going to take ramming damage. Like if I have, if you have 50 hull and I have 200, ramming you is not a consideration. It's actually a great move for me to try to ram. You. Right. Um, and I don't think, I don't think ramming would be like the end of the turn, right? Because pilot actions are the beginning of the round. Yes. Um, which also, you mentioned how this slots into 5e, like boarding is for sure going to be something that you do. And when that happens, like there is still going to be initiative roles in ship mm -hmm. combat because that determines who takes their turns where. Because after you get past the, the, the position role and the gambits, then it's just initiative. So you can kind of like, you know, this ship guy fires off his thing and now it's your turn, but you're on that ship. So now you're going to fight him. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a few other rules that I haven't really talked about yet that we are a bit out of time to discuss. I'll circle back to ramming. I think ramming is going to take, is going to hurt both ships the same amount because otherwise, because okay, then you only do it if if you are driving the, the, the big one because otherwise like, and maybe there's an upgrade. Maybe there's like a, because people in the chat are pointing out there were ships with, you know, uh, ramming prows that were designed to actually do this thing. So maybe you can get an expensive upgrade for your ship that makes it so you take less damage when you ram. Um, mm. That's something, that's one of many things I still need to circle back to. But mm. I think that's, is there anything that I haven't really gotten to yet? I don't I, think so. Just looking I, at the spreadsheet. It there's... looks groovy. I mean, all it right. looks great. So yeah, I need to tweak certain things like the repair values for all the different things. Like I, this would be a, a 10 would be essentially a 50, 50 chance, which is way too like risky. Nobody would ever try to repair anything. If it was like a 50% chance that your turn accomplishes nothing. Like that's such a defeating thing that, um, there's I, also, I don't know. there's also an interesting thing though, where the repair DC, and I, I forget if, if we covered this already, but the repair B DC being different for minor and major damage is really fun. And yeah, but the difference there is if you have major damage, you have disadvantage on the roll. So if you have major damage, mm -hmm. it's, 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 unless you have a repair kit, it's going to be really, really hard to take care of that in the middle of combat. If you get major damage to something, you may just want to run the fuck away. Like that yeah, might yeah, yeah. be the easiest thing to do there. Um, I dig that. Brennan. Um, yes. we could, I, we're out of time uh, because I, I, I need to go and help out with uh, my my new infant. But thank you so much for doing this, Brennan. This is uh, this is a dream come true to get to sh you know shoot the shit with you for two hours and uh, go go over crunchy game mechanics. And thank you for all your help, both here and before when I sent you the rules for for feedback. It's truly so damn exciting. I want to play 
in this system. It's yeah. so goddamn cool. It's so, so fun. Um, I We probably will release some, ver like I would be interested in releasing some version of this once the, because I saw a ton of people ask that in the chat as well. Uh, once once we get the season going and and have worked out some of the, the bugs, uh, I, I, you know, this would be an easy enough PDF to publish online. Mm -hmm. um, but Brennan, where can everybody find the incredible work that you create? Oh, thank you so kindly, my friend. Uh, you can find uh, uh, you can find my work youtube.com slash dimension twenty show. We have a bunch of seasons for free on there. Again, we're in an anthology actual play show from College Humor. You can find all of our stuff on dropout.tv. That's our streaming platform. Uh, and you can find me at Brennan L M on Twitter and at Brennan Lee Mulligan on Instagram. And this has been a joy, a pleasure, and an honor to talk about Magic yeah. Submarines. Thank you, Brennan, and thank you all at home. One one last time, MaximumFun.org slash join. Today's the last day. We are almost out of time. We'd love to get to 20,000 new and upgrading members. You are the only ones who can make that happen. We're at uh, 18,612. We're, we're creeping on it. We're creeping so close. So if you're uh, listening to this, if you like our shows, you like the work that we do, and you want to support us, this is, this is the time where we ask you to do that. It's the last day of it. So one last time, MaximumFun.org slash join. I hope you all are enjoying EtherC so far. Uh, we had a blast playing The Quiet Year, and I'm very excited to put these rules into practice uh, once once we've once we've polished them up a little bit. Uh, but for now, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching, and uh, have a great have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Woo!